I read the inscription engraved on the inside of the pocket watch cover. This must be similar to how a woman feels when the man she loves gives her a ring and asks for her hand in marriage. A true declaration of love. It was our seventh anniversary. We were sitting in our favorite Italian restaurant drinking good Chianti. Cassie had the sweetest smile on her face as she watched me open the box containing the silver pocket watch and chain. I thought it would look good on your leather Harley vest. I know watches aren't as functional as they once were, but I wanted to give you something completely impractical for a change. I admired the beauty of the Swiss Tissot watch and reread the inscription. Take me with you? Suddenly Cassie looked sad. I know you're leaving tomorrow. I was wondering if it's too late to ask to go with you. Cassie's request silenced me, and before I could respond, tears were streaming down her cheeks. I met Cassie eight years ago when we were both working summer jobs at one of Seattle's upscale restaurants on the South Lake Union. Cassie Taylor just finished her first year teaching health and physical education at a suburban high school. She spent her summer vacations working as a waitress. I, Edward Bud O'Brien, had three years of experience teaching biology in an urban Catholic school. I spent my summers in the good old Irish tradition, working as a bartender. It took me 20 minutes of my first shift to fall in love with her big brown eyes and friendly smile. Cassie is one of those rare women who lights up a room and makes you feel special just by being around her. It also didn't hurt that she had the slender body of a runner with long toned legs. When she walked away from the waiter with a tray of pints, I must have stared at her because Jake elbowed me in the ribs. Careful, bud. I don't want to step on your tongue. It was my first day at the restaurant after the end of the school year. I had to ask Jake, who worked full-time at the bar. What can you tell me about her? She's a teacher like you started last weekend. Her name is Cassie. She's free, friendly, sweet, and completely out of your league. Jake made that last comment while laughing. I had a reputation as a ladies' man, a guy with exceptional luck in meeting the more attractive women who frequented our bar. I can't claim to have been anything special other than the lucky recipient of the great genes of my father, Edward O'Brien Sr., which earned me the nickname Bud, rather than Junior, thankfully, and my mother, Anna Maria Simoncelli. I did my best to please Miss Cassie Taylor over the next two weeks. She was always friendly, but she declined my invitations to have a cup of coffee or go to a show. Meanwhile, I refused all attention and direct invitations from the ladies who hung out at the bar, which was difficult especially when Sarah Goodwin walked in one evening. Sarah and I had met several times over the previous two summers. We would end up on her father's 38-foot boat on Lake Union and try to keep the boat moving until dawn. The woman was insatiable, and what a body she had. That evening, when Sarah walked into the bar to rekindle our summer romance, it was hard for me to refuse, but I apologized, saying that I already had a preliminary agreement that could not be canceled. Sarah promised to stop by in a few days. Get ready for a treat, boy. I spent April in Miami and learned some new tricks. Jake was there when I turned Sarah down and gave me a look. What was it? He asked, knowing Sarah's reputation as a sex bomb. How about you and Gwen join me for coffee and pie at the diner after work tonight? Okay? Gwen, Jake's wife. She worked the same shift. Was like the big sister I never had and treated me with sisterly affection. Jake thought it was serious. I'll ask Gwen, but I'm sure she'll say yes. We closed at one o'clock, and I met up with Jake and Gwen at the 24-hour diner on the avenue. It was late, so we didn't have to wait for a table. Flo took our order, and I got straight to the point. Why is Cassie rejecting me? I acted like a gentleman and asked her out three times. Is she dating someone? Gwen laughed as she replied that one of the reasons I love Jake's wife, another is how much she respects and loves the big Norwegian. This is too funny, bud. She must be in a serious relationship if she turns you down. Flo came to the table with our coffee and pie. Gwen waited for Flo to serve us, and after we all thanked her, Gwen told me. The other waitresses informed Cassie that you're a womanizer. Your reputation is terrible, bud, especially Jamie's. You may not have considered your relationship with Jamie last summer to be exclusive, but she did. And after she found out you spent the night on Sarah's boat, while you were dating, she hates you. The well is poisoned. I had to defend myself. 
It wasn't my fault. We never promised each other anything. It's time to face the facts, bud. You can continue to get girls in bed, but decent women who want more than a quickie are taboo for you. I noticed that Jake had been silent all this time and was filling his mouth with pie. He had already finished his and began to eat Gwen's threshold. He looked up and nodded in my direction. The implication was clear. He agreed with Gwen. It was time to convince them. I know I was a ladies' man for the first two years you knew me, but I wasn't always that way. I remained faithful to my high school girlfriend until I received a Dear John letter from her while serving in Afghanistan. In college, I was completely faithful to the girl I dated until our relationship took a turn for the worse before graduation. She said my scars were a constant reminder of how stupid I was to join the military right out of high school. It took me a couple of years to even think about opening my heart again and trusting someone after two failed relationships. I spent the last year reinventing myself, getting back to who I was. Turns out I didn't need psychoanalysis. Spending time with my mom and dad helped me get back on track. And seeing you two together just confirms that. Jake and Gwen listened to me. They were probably shocked to find out who they were sitting with, and not the immature playboy who had spent the last two summers betting any decent-looking girl. That's where I am now. I want to date Cassie. I like her physically, and I like her friendliness. Call it what you will, but from the first look in her eyes and smile, I wanted to get to know her better. Help me do this, and I will promise you both that I will be an absolute gentleman. Even if she and I are not right for each other, and it doesn't lead to anything, I will not betray your trust. I promise. Here's the thing. Gwen was a complete and hopeless romantic. In her heart, she hoped that everyone would have the chance to have a relationship as great as theirs. My statement touched her deeply. She grabbed my hand across the table and smiled with tears in her eyes. I had an ally. For the rest of the week, the four of us sat in Gwen and Jake's backyard while Jake grilled salmon. We ate, drank, laughed, and shared stories. I fell in love with Cassie. She accepted my proposal at Christmas, and we got married in June. We honeymooned in Maui. Believe it or not, this was the first time I saw Cassie in a bikini. Our courtship was so short and filled with so many other responsibilities, mostly work and wedding planning, that I never stopped to realize how little experience we shared until that week in Maui. Yes, we made love for the first time two months after we started dating, but we weren't living together. Cassie was still living with her mom and dad, a very traditional, old-fashioned couple. Her parents frowned every time we spent a rare weekend together before the wedding. Cassie wasn't a virgin, but her previous boyfriends could be counted on her father's fingers, even though he was missing two fingers due to an industrial injury. The honeymoon in Maui was the first time I pushed Cassie into a few new pranks. Nothing extraordinary, at least for most couples, and nowhere near what Sarah and I did. I surprised Cassie with a leopard print nightgown and bikini, that had half the material of what she had brought with her. Where could I wear this? She asked, after she finally agreed to try on a bikini for me in our room. There's a quiet beach on the southwest side of the island. We'll go there. No one will be within a hundred feet of us. And I can watch you in the sun. Cassie agreed, and we spent a lovely day sunbathing and playing in the surf. The next day, when we went snorkeling on the boat, she put on her more modest bikini still a bold choice for her, and I told her how great she looked. Small steps, because this wonderful woman was worth the patience. The next six years were wonderful. Cassie and I got along great. We were best friends and passionate lovers. Cassie continued to open up sexually. One thing we didn't do was we never had sexual relations with other people. Our sex life was entirely between us, and as far as I thought, as good as it could be. Cassie and I had one major disagreement in our relationship, and it didn't come up until after our sixth anniversary. I have been interested in motorcyclists since childhood. It started with trail bikes. In my early twenties, I rode a sport bike, my Honda CBR a thousand. I traded in the sport bike and bought a Harley Road King custom I for two the summer I met Cassie. For our first six years together, Cassie shared my love of traveling by bike. My engagement gift to her was a set of leather clothes and a heated vest. 
she already had the helmet I bought her when we first started dating. During our engagement, we spent one weekend traveling to Vancouver and another on the Orcas Island Ferry. The summer after the wedding, we spent our weekends, which were Tuesday and Wednesday because we were still working at the restaurant during summer break, traveling to get out of the city. The Northwest U.S. has tons of great roads through the Cascades on Routes 20, 12, or 410, along the Columbia River on Route 14, and many more. The best part? Spending hours cruising these roads with the love of my life on the back of a motorcycle. Cassie loved these trips as much as I did. Until the day, about three weeks after our sixth anniversary, when two of our friends, Mark and Judy Kaluski, were killed when a drunk driver ran a red light and Mark was unable to brake in time to avoid the collision. Mark died instantly, but Judy remained in intensive care for two weeks before succumbing to her injuries. During those two weeks, Cassie and I visited her twice. I've never seen Cassie so upset. Cassie never got on my bike again. And to make matters worse, she started pestering me to sell my bike. I thought she was being unreasonable and never considered how my refusal to even discuss it would ultimately affect our marriage. In my defense, I didn't pressure Cassie to get on my bike, although I missed our weekends spent riding around the countryside in the summer. I tried to explain why I thought I was a safer and better driver than Mark. I probably rode less than a thousand miles over the next nine months, but I didn't get rid of the bike. I never considered how devastated Cassie was after spending hours at Judy's bedside. Cassie was slowly drifting away from me, emotionally and physically, but so slowly that I barely noticed until the following April. It was mid-April when I realized that we had not made love for the past three weeks, and probably only once every two weeks for the previous two months. We haven't spent an entire weekend together since February, although I did go on a Saturday road trip with local band HOG, Harley Owners Group, during spring break. The house was dark and cold the evening I returned from this trip. Cassie had spent the day at her parents and didn't return home until 10 o'clock at night. The few times we talked about it, we had the same conversation, over and over again. Bud, I can't imagine having kids if you keep riding that thing. I'm not going to be a lonely widow raising our kids alone. Of course, I always pointed out how unreasonable she was. Cassie, look at all our motorcycle friends who are still riding and haven't had an accident. We walked in circles. Cassie pulled statistics from the internet and showed me newspaper articles to prove her point. I did my best to counter her arguments. I've been riding a motorcycle since I was 12, except when I was abroad, and I've never had an accident. One of the great benefits of living in western Washington is the lack of harsh winters. I would have a hard time not getting on my bike at least once every two weeks. We weren't moving anywhere and were moving away from each other. Much later, I learned that there was a snake in the garden who wanted to take advantage of our disagreement. By the end of May, I was tired of it. Cassie and I barely spoke and tried to avoid each other. We shared dinners and a bed, but our conversations were purely utilitarian, without a spark of intimacy in or out of bed. The marriage was on life support, if not already dead. I made a decision. As soon as the school year is over... I'll get on my bike and spend four weeks doing what I've always wanted to do, cross the country and back again. To make a statement, I was leaving the day after our seventh anniversary. Screw it. I wasn't a complete asshole. I told Cassie my plans and started sleeping in the guest room three weeks before I was scheduled to leave. Within the first week of my announcement, I would come home to find Cassie crying in the living room. I was surprised. I really didn't think she cared. The thing is, I still loved her. As much as I tried to harden my heart to the fact that our marriage was over, I wanted to hug her and magically make our problems disappear. But all of us scientific types know that there is no such thing as magic. On the morning of our anniversary, Cassie asked if we could have dinner that night at a nice Italian restaurant downtown that we liked. Why not? Was my dry answer. We dressed up. Cassie wore my favorite blue dress and five-inch heels. I put on a suit and tie. It was a weekday, so the restaurant was half empty. As usual, as we walked to our table, some of the other diners looked at us with approval. With Cassie next to me, we really looked like a great couple. We ordered a bottle of wine while we read the menu. 
After ordering, while we were tasting the wine, Cassie pulled out a box from her small clutch purse. As I read the inscription out loud, Cassie asked a question. I know you're leaving tomorrow. I was wondering if it's too late to ask to go with you. I almost fell off my chair in surprise. Between the beautiful pocket watch, the touching inscription, and her request to accompany me on a motorcycle ride, I was amazed. I struggled to get the words out. I would be happy. I want to start over, bud. I want to be your lover and friend again. I'm still terrified of the thought of riding your bike, but I've thought about it. I'd like to try to share it with you again. I didn't give Cassie my gift, which was in the breast pocket of my jacket. A homemade postcard with a photo on the front of me, sitting on my bike waving goodbye. No words, just my wedding ring inside. If Cassie noticed that I wasn't wearing it, she didn't say anything. I excused myself, went to the bathroom, tore up the card, and returned the ring to its place. When I returned, our dinner was already on the table. I didn't give you anything. I know. You were going to leave me. Just tell me that you still love me and want this. That would be the best gift of all. And also that you put your wedding ring back on. Cassie gave me her millionth smile. We returned home that night and made love twice. I delayed my departure for a day and spent it preparing the bike for Cassie and her things. Cassie spent the day preparing our apartment for our month-long absence. We will be on the road for 30 days. 8,000 miles will be covered in 20 days on the road and 10 days of rest, entertainment, and sightseeing. Bud, do you believe in divine intervention? We were in a hotel bed outside of Spokane the first night of our trip. I thought it was a strange question so late at night and couldn't understand why Cassie would bring it up now. You mean when God or a higher power intervenes on a person's behalf? Yes, something like that. Cassie and I had discussed religion and our views on God several times before, but like many modern couples, religion was not a central part of our lives. Although I was raised Catholic and taught in a Catholic school, it had been many years since I had been to church for anything other than a wedding or funeral. I wasn't sure if this was the best time to think about such a deep topic. We'd been on the road most of the day and had just had a few mugs of strong ale, but something was bothering Cassie, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to figure out what was bothering her. So I answered, Well, we talked earlier about how I struggled with the idea of a Hashem, and even if I could believe in a Hashem, could I accept that He directs our actions or even the weather, the oceans, nature? That's even harder for me to accept, da. Why? Because I can't reconcile the idea of an all-powerful God with all the terrible things that happen in the world. But what about all the good, wonderful things that are happening? I understand what you're saying. My mom still prays and she believes it helps. When Dad recovered from cancer, she truly believed it was because of her prayers to St. Jude, and I would be the last person to try to refute her faith. Cassie nodded. Yes, I know. Why does God answer one person's prayers and not another? Or why would any God allow a little child to get cancer? I've struggled with these questions, too. We spent the next half hour exchanging views. I was on the verge of asking Cassie what prompted her to bring up the subject when I noticed her eyelids closing. After a minute, Cassie started purring like she does when she falls asleep. It's been a long day. I'll have to wait to ask my question. The next morning we woke up late, grabbed a quick bite at the hotel breakfast bar, and got back on the bike. Continuing to avoid interstates, we headed northeast on US-2 to Whitefish. When I ride a motorcycle, I block out all external stimuli except the road and the scenery. No loud radio or other electronic noise, I don't read a map or check my smartphone for messages or calls. All the distractions that tempt me in the car are absent when I'm driving. I use this time to reflect. My mind achieves a certain clarity. The sensation is best explained in Robert Persig's Zen and The Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, or Melissa Pearson's The Ultimate Vehicle, Understanding Motorcycles. When Cassie started riding with me, which was her first experience on a motorcycle, she had a hard time understanding my passion for two wheels. She didn't understand how we could drive for hours without talking. I gave Cassie both of the above books to read. Then, after spending more time on the back of my bike, 
in the privacy of her helmet, watching the world go by, seeing things you never see sitting in the box of a car. She agreed with me that it had become a special way to share without words. When I suggested buying a couple of communication devices for our helmets, Cassie looked at me as if I was crazy. Never, was all she said. So today, the day after Cassie's strange question about divine intervention, we were probably both enjoying some privacy and a chance to reflect on our lives and marriage. That night, Cassie finally opened up and told me what had been troubling her these past months. We sat on the deck of the hotel's outdoor pool. It was already after ten, and there was no one around. I had a can of beer, and Cassie had a plastic glass of cheap Merlot. I almost cheated on you. I wasn't surprised. I somehow suspected that something was going on at least since February. What surprised and relieved me most was that she used the word slightly. There's a guy at school you met once. His name is Owen Miller, and he made it clear that he wanted me to leave you and marry him. I tried to remain calm. It sounds like you two spent a lot of time together. You said almost cheated? What do you mean? Cassie laid it all out. It means that I spent too much time sharing intimate details of our life with him and allowed him to get into my thoughts. After I told him about my fears that you would end up like Mark, Owen used it. He knew that I wanted to have children. He showed me articles in the newspaper every time there was an accident. I let him convince me that you couldn't love me unless you were willing to give up the ride. He planted in my brain the idea that I shouldn't let you be the father of my children if you're just going to leave me a widow and our children fatherless. I can see how this could affect you, especially considering how little attention I paid to your fears after Mark and Judy died. I didn't tell you. Part of my reaction was because Judy was three months pregnant when she died. Only Mark and I knew she wanted to wait until the second trimester before telling anyone else because she had lost their first child. Because of the miscarriage. I don't know why I didn't tell you. Maybe because you were already grieving over the loss of a close friend. And I didn't see the point in making it worse. So I just carried it inside of me and it was affecting me more than I realized. The news about the baby was terrible, but I wanted to get back to our marriage and Cassie's case. How far did you go with Miller? We had a make-out session. What? Like in high school? No groping? I saw how difficult it was for her to answer my question, but she answered. No groping, just kissing. Don't say only. The fact that you kissed that idiot is driving me crazy. I was starting to lose my composure. Cassie began to cry again. I'm sorry. Yes, I kissed him, but I never touched him, and he never had the chance to touch my breasts or anything. Why? What happened? After our makeout session, he told me that he had booked a room at the Sheraton for the following Saturday. By then, you and I were barely talking, and I could leave for the day without bothering you. We met in the lobby and got into the elevator. The doors were closing, and then they opened again. There was an elderly couple standing in front of us. They apologized for pressing the call button too soon, but I smiled and told them everything was fine and held the door open for them. They were so sweet, both smiling, holding hands. The woman looked at me and said they were celebrating their 40th anniversary. She looked me straight in the eyes and said, You'll never know how good someone can be. Life until you spend so many years with the one man you love and who loves you. Just then, the elevator doors opened. The couple got off on the 22nd floor, one floor below us, still smiling and holding hands. Before the doors closed, I pressed the open button and jumped out of the elevator. Owen followed me and asked what I was doing. I, I told him I was avoiding the biggest mistake of my life. I went back downstairs, pulled out of the parking lot and drove home. I sat there looking at my wife, unable to say anything at that moment. Cassie filled the silence. When I asked you yesterday, if you believed in divine intervention, here's why. How could I be so close to committing adultery and be so lucky that there was that couple in the elevator? Sometimes I think they were angels. You may not have slept with him or committed adultery, but you definitely cheated, emotionally and definitely physically, when you kissed him. That's what your mom said. My mom? Yes, I've been talking to your mom since it happened. I didn't know who else to turn to. I was so confused. We've met several times over the past three weeks. She told me to ask if I could join her on this trip. 
she told me that I couldn't hide behind the technicality of not actually having sex with another man and that I needed to open up to you. She knows me so well after all these years. And your mom, the smartest man I know. Cassie looked into my eyes as she sat across from me, practically holding her breath. It's going to take me a while to process this. I'm so angry at you right now. What should I do? Should I take another room to give you space? Should I fly home? No, neither of these will do any good. Damn, Cassie. I still love you. But finding out how you let that idiot come between us really pisses me off. I saw Cassie sigh with relief, realizing that I had chosen neither the first nor the second option. She still had a chance to stay married to me. But I wasn't going to let her get off too easily. She was one step away from me leaving her. The only thing that allowed this marriage to hang by a thread was that she didn't sleep with that idiot. We're not out of the woods yet, Cassie. Give me time to figure out how we can fix this, if it's even possible. This will keep her quiet for a while and give her something to think about. We slept in the same bed, but it was a large bed, which allowed us to avoid her touching. I didn't even kiss her goodnight. The next morning I decided to spend another day at the motel, my emotions too high to drive safely. We spent hours by the pool talking, but holding back the alcohol to keep the conversation civil. Around noon, a thought occurred to me. Are you still talking? He calls. I don't answer. Then he sends a message and I don't answer. I delete the texts as soon as they come. Next time he texts you, let me know. Don't delete it. One of the lucky moments in this whole saga, Owen Miller was the assistant principal of Cassie's school. If it had been another teacher, I would have little influence over this idiot. But as a member of the administration, he was in a deep hole. It didn't take long before Cassie received a text message from him. Why don't you answer me? I thought we had something special. Please leave me alone. Walking up to your room at the Sheraton was the stupidest thing I've ever done. Come on. You wanted this just as much as I did. Don't pretend to be innocent. I thought you were my friend. I'm your friend. But I can be more. You need to find out how much more. It's hard to believe that any man has more than my husband. Miller must have been drunk. Otherwise, there is no explanation for what he did next. And he probably only did this because Cassie told him earlier that she was deleting all his texts, assuming I still don't know anything. Miller sent a photo. The fool didn't realize that I was now holding him by the balls. I told you to leave me alone. Don't write or call me anymore. I showed Cassie a series of texts, including photos. Is this the idiot you were going to replace me with? Cassie just sobbed and apologized over and over again. It was a long night. Of course, he continued to send texts over the next few days. Each message deepened the hole he had begun to dig for himself. We were on the road again. It's a shame we couldn't enjoy Glacier National Park more than we did. We both tried to get back into the right frame of mind. I admit, Cassie tried her best. We had our ups and downs, but I stayed calm and told her to stop walking on eggshells. Over the next four days and nights, we talked and planned how we could overcome this and connect again. We made love again, and it really helped. We checked into a roadside motel about an hour before Madison. It was a decent day traveling through the Wisconsin Dells. We planned to stay an extra night in the area to recover from the 1,600 miles since our last stop in Whitefish. After showering and changing clothes, we walked across the street to a tavern that the motel manager said had a great fish plate and cold beer. Cassie was dressed in a modest sundress with flip-flops, nothing too flashy considering we were in an unfamiliar city. The fish was cooked just right and they had Lehnenkugel beer on tap. It was nice that they had something other than the ubiquitous Coors Light and Bud Light. I finished my second beer and asked Cassie if she was ready to go back to the motel when someone started playing the jukebox. A big guy, he had to be at least six feet four inches tall and 250 pounds, walked up to our table. He ignored me and stared at Cassie, running his eyes up and down her body. Let's go dance. He extended his hand to Cassie. That's the thing with infidelity. It makes you doubt your spouse, Trust either disappears or is at least questioned. 
It was less than five seconds, but in that five-second pause, Cassie and I looked at each other. I wondered if Cassie wanted to dance with this guy. Cassie later told me that she was waiting for me to step in and tell him she was unavailable while I was waiting for her to say no. The big guy took advantage of those five seconds. He placed his hand on the top of Cassie's arm and pulled her to her feet. This action caused Cassie to react. I don't want to dance with you, she said, breaking free from his grip. What the hell you don't want to, was his response as he grabbed her again. By then, I had already risen from the table, grabbing his other hand. I'd appreciate it if you'd leave my wife alone. She said she didn't want to dance. I thought that if my request was polite, it might diffuse the situation. The big guy moved quickly and did the unexpected. He turned to me, let go of Cassie, and pulled the hunting knife from its sheath on his hip, cursing. Don't you dare touch me. He swung the knife as I jumped back, but the knife ran across my arm as I tried to protect myself from the blade. He rushed at me again. I retreated to the pool table and grabbed the cue. My right hand was bleeding, but with my good left hand I held the cue tightly, swinging it while holding the pool table between us. I must have really pissed him off because he made the stupid mistake of fainting to the right and moving to the left. The feint did not deceive me, and when he rounded my right side, I hit him with a good blow of the cue. This only angered him further, and he came at me in a rage. I pushed the back of the cue straight into his mouth and knocked him out. At that moment, the police arrived. They had to call an ambulance for the big guy. One of his friends tried to pick up his teeth from the floor. He seemed to think the dentist could put them back in. I wrapped a piece of gauze around my arm that one of the medics gave me while they tended to the big guy. I barely had time to wrap it when the sheriff handcuffed me and read my rights. Where are you taking him? Cassie was on the verge of screaming. He will be processed and jailed. At best, there will be a bail hearing tomorrow. But he didn't do anything until the guy grabbed me. Then the guy pulled out a knife and cut him. Cassie tried her best to stand up for me, but the sheriff wouldn't listen. He told his deputy to take statements from the people at the bar. Before I was taken out, I saw two or three of the big guy's friends huddled around the deputy. I found out later that they didn't even take Cassie's statement. In fact, they kicked her out of the police station when she went there to try to tell them again what happened. When I tried to tell the sheriff my side, he smirked. So why should I believe some out-of-town yuppie and not one of the citizens of our city, especially when no one else in the bar disputes his friend's story? There's a lot I wanted to say, but when it comes to dealing with local police, it's best to avoid confrontation. Hell, for all I knew, this cop could be the giant's cousin. So I kept my answers polite. Because you know I'm telling the truth. Travis says your wife was hitting on all the guys at the bar, said you were jealous and started a fight. This was complete nonsense because Cassie never left our table while we were there. You asked my wife if it was true? Well, I've found that very few women admit to being approachable, especially after a fight. Cassie and I apparently got caught in a time loop and ended up back in the 50s. I decided to go a different route. Am I entitled to a telephone call? Three hours later, I was still sitting in the holding cell when I heard a commotion. Someone in the square was persistently cursing. Soon the deputy opened my cell and let me out. We entered the room and I saw a tall man who was harshly criticizing the sheriff. Are you crazy? You have a prisoner who needs medical attention and you keep him locked up? Not to mention he shouldn't have been arrested for self-defense in the first place. It turns out that this man was one of the assistant district attorneys. My commander in Afghanistan, Captain Roberts, was now the district attorney of Western Kansas, and he was the recipient of my only phone call. Good to know the right people. He had to make the right calls to the right people on my behalf. The assistant district attorney was still speaking loudly. Did you know that this out-of-town yuppie, as you called him, has two purple hearts and a silver star? I admit. I liked how the sheriff got reprimanded. The assistant district attorney looked at me. Sorry about all this. I have my car outside. Let's look at your hand. We got out and drove four miles to the emergency room. On the way, he gave me his business card after writing his cell number on it. I thanked him again, and we parted. It turned out that my hand needed 20 stitches, and the tendon in my index finger was severed and required surgery. So I couldn't ride a motorcycle, 
because I wouldn't be able to brake or accelerate. Cassie met me at the hospital. She returned to the motel and spent time calling and trying to find help after the sheriff kicked her out of the police station. The next morning, all charges against me were dropped and I was allowed to leave the county. We rented a U-Haul truck, secured the bike in it, and headed west. So my dream of traveling from one end of the country to the other remained a dream. Cassie and I took turns driving the truck, stopping the first night for a few hours of rest and returning home by midnight on the second day, exhausted but glad to sleep in our own bed. I decided to make waves and give the sheriff something to think about. I hired an aggressive lawyer from his county and sued the county and the sheriff. We settled the case for $100,000. The lawyer took 30%. We could have gotten more, but I refused to sign the non-disclosure agreement. My lawyer didn't like this because it significantly reduced his payout. Last I heard, the sheriff lost the next election. It's a pity. And he's damn unlucky. Cassie and I continued to work on our marriage with the support of my parents instead of a professional counselor. We had a good chance of success because Cassie was truly sorry for what she had done. It helped that we had great friends and role models in Jake and Gwen, and of course, we realized how close each of us was to losing the best thing in our lives. Meanwhile, it's payback time for Mr. Owen Miller. Any thoughts of physical retribution disappeared after the bar fight. The damage I did to the big guy was public information. If I were caught, this beating could be used against me in any criminal or civil case. My revenge had to be legal. We hired an employment lawyer and shared a series of texts and voicemails that Cassie received from Miller. Miller countered with some nonsense about how Cassie was a seductress who wouldn't leave him alone. The school district foolishly refused Cassie's transfer request. So Cassie quit and started working full-time at the restaurant. It was Cassie's decision to quit. Although she loved teaching, I agreed that it was the right decision for our current situation. We decided to play hard. I called a friend who worked at the Seattle Times. The headline in Sunday's Seattle Times read, When No Means Yes. The subtitle read, When a local school district administrator won't take no for an answer. The Cassie School District ended up experiencing major upheaval. Not only was Owen Miller fired, but two administrators at the district's central office were demoted. After two years, we eventually settled the case for $200,000 and two years' salary. I'm not one for lawsuits, but in today's world, that's usually the only way to get justice. I recently read Chernov's biography of Alexander Hamilton. It's amazing that a couple of hundred years ago, men settled their differences with dueling pistols. Unfortunately, the person who was right did not always emerge victorious. Just think, not much has changed. Now the guy with a better, more ruthless lawyer will probably win. Lawyers instead of pistols. Cassie and I have nothing to complain about. Everything worked out well for us in the end, but not perfect. The hospital in Wisconsin didn't treat my hand properly, and I had to go under the knife again so I could use my right index finger. I couldn't ride a motorcycle for two months because of the cast and therapy. Maybe it was a sign. By then, Cassie and I were fully committed to each other again, and we're talking about buying a house and having kids. After finishing my rehab, I boarded the Road King and headed northeast toward the North Cascade Highway. I spent the day alone and made a decision. Without telling Cassie, I put the bike up for sale and sold it within a week. It took her a few days, but one day Cassie came home from her new job at the local gym and asked me, Bud, where's your bike? I stood at the stove, stirring a pot of spaghetti sauce my grandmother's recipe that Cassie adores. I sold it, with a tone of, okay, not a big loss. Why did you do it? Why do you think so? I hope you didn't do this because of me. I almost laughed at the absurdity of her statement. She continued, Bud, I tried. I stopped asking you to quit skating. You didn't have to sell it. That's what made it possible. It wasn't something you forced. It was my decision, mine alone. Cassie ran into my arms and hugged me tightly. How do you know? Now I was puzzled. I learned that. How did you know I was pregnant? I only found out today. 
frost on the skin. I hugged Cassie and told her how glad I was. We'll start looking for a house with a yard this weekend. I don't remember ever receiving a kiss like this before. Look how wrong you can be. I wrote earlier that as a scientist, I do not believe in magic. Twenty weeks later, holding a photo of Cassie's ultrasound, I changed my mind. Twins. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Second story. For centuries, novelists and other writers have argued that there is a fine line between love and hate. Until now, this assumption was based solely on the intensity of both emotions and explained how a person can love someone when they get married and hate them when they get divorced. Now, in July 2013, Professor Semir Zeki of University College London published a scientific study under his direction, published in the online journal PLOS One, showing that there is a biological basis for the relationship between these most powerful of human emotions. Magnetic resonance, imaging, and other studies suggest they are closely linked because some of the same brain circuits are activated in response to what may seem like opposing feelings. But what about sexual attraction as opposed to romantic love? Can a person lust for someone he hates? Both in academia and in real life, I, Greg Nelson, have faced this question. I was adopted by a loving couple before I could remember anything. They told me I was four months old. After my adoptive father had several affairs, they stopped loving each other and my adoptive mother divorced him when I was five. I almost never saw him again. However, my mother's brother was still a great father to me, and his wife was almost a second mother to me. My aunt and uncle were always kind to me for the significant amount of time I spent with them throughout high school, especially when my mom had to work or had problems with her life. They provided for me, made sure I wanted for nothing, and even paid for part of my college education. However, the most important thing was the love they gave me. With the exception of my mother, aunt, and uncle, I was always underestimated as a child and often as an adult. It was, and still is, because of my body type. No matter what I do, I will never have a saggy waist. I have what almost everyone who mentions it has, a beautiful face with piercing ice blue eyes and silky blonde hair that is attractive to women, but my body clearly lacks core tone. Due to the apparent lack of core muscle tone in my body, I was bullied at school until rumors began to spread that maybe I wasn't really that good at taking tests. Although my hands weren't particularly fast, my upper body strength was unbelievable given my appearance, but if I got to my opponent, it would be the end of him. This became especially noticeable after my uncle, who earned a black belt in judo as a teenager, taught me several submission techniques and chokes that suited my strengths. My main problem as a child was that I was not bullied by boys at school and that I did not have a father at home. Rather, my main problem, unfortunately, was the black spot of my aunt and uncle. It was their eldest daughter, Amber. My aunt and uncle's son, Josh, who was a year younger than me, and their youngest daughter, Brittany, who was three years younger than me, were not only cousins, but also good friends. Amber, who was two years older than me, was and still is the most vain, nasty, toxic version of a person imaginable. Although Amber also treated Josh and Brittany poorly, it was nothing like the way she treated me. She called me every offensive name she could think of. For most people, insults are simply an expression of speech. In her case, she actually kept a spiral notebook of offensive comments and phrases that she had made up, heard from others, or picked up from reading trashy novels just about me. One of her favorite things was to tell me that my biological parents didn't want me because I was a piece of shit and that my adoptive father ran away because he couldn't stand me, and that my mother only pretended to love me because she felt sorry for me. It wasn't until I was 13 that my mother finally convinced me that everything Amber had said was bullshit. It was then that I learned about the adventures of my adoptive father. Amber also liked to play pranks on me, 
such as spitting on my... One of Amber's favorite tricks was to politely ask me to do something for her in front of my aunt or uncle. She knew how much I adore them. I knew they would never think badly of her, and I knew how much it annoyed me to have to do her errands. Amber would probably make sure, in the presence of my aunt or uncle, that I didn't do what I promised. Oh, Greg, remember when you promised to fix the flat tire on my bike? Have you done this yet, honey? She asked in a pleasant, melodious voice. This was typical of her sophisticated approach. She always got away with it. In the end, I just accepted it as my situation in life. Although Amber was rude to almost everyone she felt she couldn't use in some way, she seemed to take special pleasure in trying to make my life miserable for reasons I could never understand. I also could not understand how my aunt and uncle, usually such smart and insightful people, could not see evil in their eldest daughter. It must have been her pretty, innocent face and the way she constantly sucked up to her parents, as well as her success in school and sports. Even though she was a terrible person, she got excellent grades and was probably the most athletic member of our extended family. Up until that point, the happiest day of my life was when Amber went to college out of state. However, even then, she would call her parents and ask them to ask me to do some menial work for her. At least I didn't have to interact with her in person. My birthday falls in the summer. The day after my 18th birthday, my aunt and uncle threw a party in my honor at their home for friends and family. Even though Amber was home from college for the summer break, she couldn't decide to attend, even though she had apparently returned from some trip with friends before it was over, because the meeting with her changed my life that day. Since the downstairs bathroom was occupied, I went to the upstairs bathroom at my aunt and uncle's house around nine o'clock in the evening on the day of the party, which was already ending. The bathroom door was slightly open, so I assumed no one was there. It was a large bathroom with a bathtub and a lot of space behind the door. Why the hell are you barging in here? You're invading my privacy, you brainless piece of shit, said the pleasant voice of dear Amber. She stood next to the bathroom with her hands on her hips and didn't even try to cover herself. I was speechless. Before closing the door, I stuck my head back in and with a mocking expression on my face said, You look disgusting. As a result, she cursed at me and slammed the door as I was leaving. It was difficult for me to think straight for the rest of the night. Judy, a friend who had been making provocative comments about me, noticed my predicament. Neither Judy nor I saw a long future for ourselves. But we enjoyed being together a couple times a week until the summer ended and we went to different colleges. Most of the time I was with Judy, my thoughts were with Amber. When I was a sophomore in college, Amber got married. I felt sorry for the poor guy until I met him. His name was George. He was about my height, 185 centimeters, 100 kilograms, although with six-pack abs instead of the noticeable belly that I always carried with me, and which was the main reason people underestimated me. He was also very good-looking. However, he was just as much of an asshole as Amber. They deserve each other. I thought after a five-minute conversation with this smug, arrogant, sarcastic idiot. In the lead-up to the wedding, Amber took her disgusting habit of sending me on missions in front of her parents to new heights. I could barely work for the summer, so much of my time was spent completing her endless assignments. The only time I was persistent was when she asked me to do something for George, and the only payback for that was that I accidentally caught her, and sometimes the bridesmaids trying on different outfits and being almost naked. I was an usher at the ceremony, danced my head off at the reception, and even picked up one of the tipsy bridesmaids in an empty conference room next to the hotel ballroom where the reception was held. The only downside is that Amber looked so damn sexy. The summer a year after sweet Amber and George got married, Josh hosted a pool party at my aunt and uncle's house, with their permission, while they were out of town. My mom was there, Josh and Brittany and their boyfriends, me and my girlfriend, and a lot of mutual friends of all ages. Amber and George kindly graced us with their presence about halfway through the party. Amber had apparently been drinking before the party and downed two martinis during the party. Despite my best efforts to avoid her, 
plus I was wearing mirrored sunglasses, which made it easier to see her in a bikini from afar, she and George had me cornered. She started telling me that they needed my help to move to another apartment in two weekends. Her parents weren't there, and I was still angry that I was the errand boy for her wedding, and her tone was more commanding than questioning. So I exploded. I'm not your fucking errand boy anymore. I snapped at her. Listen, you're a brainiac. You help, or I'll tell mom and dad that you're being a jerk to me. I'm done with your games. Tell them what you want, I growled. You have no right to talk to my wife like that, boy, George growled threateningly. Fuck you, George. You're an asshole just like her, I snapped back, throwing my sunglasses aside. George and I got into a fight. At first, Amber approached him and fawned over him, after I made fun of her by saying, It's nothing serious, Amber, just his pride. I wouldn't want to deprive you of the only idiot who was stupid enough to marry you. She jumped up and hit me. Stop waving Amber around. It will hurt you. Seeing that she did not calm down, I dragged her to the side of the pool and threw her into the water. With the help of my mom and Brittany, George was revived and he and Amber left the party in a huff. Surprisingly, or perhaps not, no one else left. After Amber left, Josh, Brittany, and a few friends patted me on the back and said, Great job, Greg. It was great to see these idiots put in their place, or something like that. Even my mother didn't judge me. It would be better if this didn't happen, dear, was her only comment. Then she kissed the bruise on my left cheek. The reason I mentioned the study on the relationship between hate and love is because I knew about it in advance. The other two scientific studies were conducted in tandem by researchers in England and the United States. One of the other studies was on romantic love versus lust, and a study I volunteered for about 16 months ago was on lust versus hate. Although the last two studies have not yet reached any conclusions, the researchers, psychologists, as well as doctors and MRI technicians have given me important feedback on my participation. Of the 25 or so people studied to date, I have by far the strongest lust-hate reaction to Amber's photographs. It seems that the brain circuits that are activated in me when I look at her photos cover the entirety of the hate and lust circuits in the average male brain. I also received free informal psychological counseling on how to cope with my situation. When my aunt and uncle returned from a trip out of town, they heard about an argument between me, Amber, and George at a pool party. Apparently my mom, Josh, and Brittany had prepared them properly because they didn't assume I was at fault. However, my uncle insisted that I come to dinner with him. My aunt, Amber and George, the weekend after the incident. My uncle emphasized the importance of getting things right in the family, sympathized with both me and these idiots, and made us shake hands. Amber was a regular asshole. Even though Amber was an adult, her extravagance and pseudo-extravagant regime required my aunt and uncle to subsidize her and George's lifestyle, until her grandparents' trust fund came into effect when she turned 30. After that dinner, when I was in the presence of others, I tried to be nice to Amber and George. In private, I had nothing to say to George, and Amber and I continued to trade insults. My intelligence was also often underestimated due to my physique, but I was not stupid. I graduated from engineering school in four years and received a partial academic scholarship after my freshman year so my aunt and uncle didn't have to spend as much money on my education. When I graduated from school, I had four job offers. I didn't want to settle for the best, even though it was in my hometown. The reason I didn't want to accept the lucrative offer from XYZ Corp. was because Amber also worked there. She worked in public relations, and there was sometimes interaction between public relations and engineering, especially when introducing new products. I hated repeating school gossip when Amber told anyone who would listen. My uncle persuaded me to think hard and accept XYZ's offer. When he told Amber about my decision in my presence, a devilish smile appeared on her lips and she falsely congratulated me. At XYZ, I learned that Amber was a sexual target for several account managers. Amber had a bad reputation in high school and college, but as far as I knew, she was only cheating on them and had no intention of cheating on George. However, her teasing was unpleasant. Then there was a Christmas party to which the couple were not invited. 
Although I wasn't paying much attention because I was courting Jessica, an attractive divorcee from accounting who was about five years older than me, I couldn't help but notice how drunk Amber was. This was unusual because she usually tolerated alcohol very well. In fact, I've never seen her drunk before. As three account executives I knew, interested in her and whom she had teased mercilessly, helped her out of the hotel dining room. I thought that perhaps something more than alcohol was to blame for her malaise. I had a classic good versus evil battle going on in my head as I tried to decide whether to be happy that Amber was screwing up or, despite my dislike for her, to call it a day. I made my decision when Jessica apparently noticed it too and commented to me. By the time I left the dining room, the elevator doors were already closing behind the four of them. Fortunately, he stopped on the second floor, where the guys apparently rented a room. I ran up the stairs and Jessica kicked off her high heels and followed me. I got to them, before the door to their room was bolted. I pushed her. What the hell is going on here? I asked a rhetorical question, noticing that Amber was already naked. None of your damn business, Nelson. I called 911. Unsurprisingly, Amber was under the influence of illegal substances. The three idiots were arrested and fired. Jessica and I received an award and bonuses from XYZ. My aunt, uncle, and mother fawned over me. My uncle cried when he hugged me the next day before he went to pick up George and then Amber from the hospital. Jessica and I received our bonus checks and spent a long weekend together. As with Judy, Jessica and I didn't foresee a long-term relationship in the future, but we enjoyed being together for about five months until our passion cooled. However, my constant problem was that often when I was with Jessica, I imagined Amber. George actually thanked me sincerely after the incident. He didn't actually treat me any better soon after, but at least he was sincere in his gratitude. Amber, on the other hand, was still her old ass. As she smiled and thanked me in front of her parents as they left the room, she said, Even a piece of shit like you can do something right at least once in your life. Don't bother yourself with this idiot. And she leisurely walked away. About six months after the Christmas party, I heard a rumor that Amber was having an affair with the married vice president. It didn't really surprise me that she cheated considering how selfish she was, and I didn't really care because I hated her and almost hated George. About a month after I first heard this rumor, a conference related to our business was being held in a city about 1,500 kilometers away. I was invited to attend as a representative of XYZ Company. Imagine my surprise when, about a week before the conference, George invited me to have lunch with him. After George struck his usual pose and casually talked about local sports teams, a thoughtful expression appeared on his face that I had never seen before. Greg, please be honest with me by answering a few questions, he whispered. I'll try, I said, a little taken aback. You don't like Amber, do you? After a short pause and looking around to see who might be nearby, I asked, George, you're not writing this down, are you? No, he muttered, stuttering. Empty all your pockets and take off your jacket, I said. He looked at me strangely, but did as I asked. After the examination, I said, Okay, this is not to tell any of the family members, but I hate her. Sorry, but just the thought of her gives me goosebumps. Would you tell me if she was having an affair? I could if I had real evidence, I said. What's the matter? I feel that she is unhappy. She might just be hanging around because according to our marriage contract... He continued before I interrupted him. Do you have a marriage contract? I asked. Yes. According to the prenup, if she cheats on me before my trust fund comes in, she gets nothing from it. That's a lot of money. My grandparents were rich and separated from my father and aunt before they died, so they left everything to me in a trust fund. I will have access to them in two years. I'm not a private detective, I said in a knowing tone, not a sarcastic one. I know, but you hate Amber and you have integrity, as demonstrated by the incident. Amber is going to the same conference as you next week. Please, I'm begging you, tell me if you see anything suspicious. I'll do whatever you want, he said in a pleading, submissive tone that was very different from his usual arrogant tone. I thought about it a little. He started to say something, but I just raised my hand and said, 
I'll think about it. I finally decided that if she cheated, then it gave me the potential to get revenge and bring some misery into her life. Okay, George, I muttered. If at the conference I receive some real information, not just assumptions or rumors, that she is cheating, I will tell you about it. However, you must never reveal this to anyone and will only use my information to hire a private investigator and only use his or her testimony if you want to divorce Amber. Thanks, dude. Thank you so much, he muttered excitedly. Wait, that's not all. I'm not doing this just because I hate Amber, I objected. If I find out anything worthwhile and you end up getting divorced, I want $10,000 from your trust fund. Tomorrow we will go to the lawyer, discuss attorney-client privilege with both of us, and then inform him of the deal. I got it, man, thanks, George exclaimed enthusiastically, and then enthusiastically began to eat his previously untouched lunch. The conference lasted all Tuesday, all Wednesday, and then around 4 p.m. on Thursday. The vice president she was rumored to be dating Ched Simmons was there, too. I really wasn't sure if I was going to check on Amber or not, but it became more likely since Simmons was there. Simmons was someone who was never kind to me or supportive of XYZ's engineering department, so his firing wouldn't bother me at all. Tuesday night, after the conference dinner, I overheard Amber, as I expected, talking to George on her cell phone from the hotel lobby, telling him how tired she was for the day and that she was going to bed early. Afterwards, I secretly followed her and Simmons and saw them, separately, both enter room 612, just a few doors down from my room 619. On Wednesday after dinner, there was a party. Simmons was completely drunk. As he sat back in his chair, his face covered in shit, Amber and two other women were sitting in the booth. Amber metal glares at him. I went. Girls, I turned to the women in the booth. It looks like I should show Mr. Simmons to his room. Do you know which one it is? Get the key card out of his pocket, Amber answered politely, since there were other women nearby. I took out and handed her the card. He's in room 612, she said, looking at the key. I don't know if she thought she was fooling someone because the room numbers aren't on the key cards, but I played along. Can you help me take him upstairs? I asked Amber. Okay, she growled, and then realized that there were two other people nearby, and said in a pleasant voice, That's really nice of you, Cousin Greg. After we took him to his room, I smiled slyly at Amber and said, It looks like he won't be able to be with you tonight. How sad for you. Fuck you, asshole. We're not sleeping, she said defensively. Then why did you spend last night here? I asked. This confused her. Listen, you don't know what you're talking about. Maybe George will believe you and not me, I retorted with the look of a cat who just ate a canary. I turned and walked out the door. As I opened the door to room 61, I turned to 612 and saw Amber watching me with a stern expression on her face. I showered, put on clean boxers, my usual sleepwear, and lay on the bed to watch TV. There was a knock on the door. I turned off the TV, went to the door and asked, Who's there? This is Amber. We need to talk, was the answer. I opened the door. Amber brushed past me and stopped. Greg, let me be honest, she began. Now you're going to call me Greg instead of shit or something like that? I asked, smiling. Would you rather I called you that? she asked, crossing her arms over her chest. Then I would know that it's really you, and not some cyborg that looks like you, I retorted. Okay, she answered after a pause. Asshole, let me be frank. I need you not to tell George about Simmons. Even if you're wrong, I think George is suspicious, and it could cause a scandal. If you want me to listen to you, you must be honest, I said, emphasizing the word honest. Admit that you're cheating with Simmons, if looks could kill, then the imaginary lightning from her piercing green eyes would have struck me down on the spot. After I had stared back at her for a full thirty seconds, she said, Okay, I admit that Simmons and I were last night. Just please don't tell George. Think about what would happen to Mom and Dad if they found out. Don't play on my love for your parents, I snapped. I hate George almost as much as I hate you, 
so I probably wouldn't have told him if it weren't for the fact that you're cheating with Simmons. If it was anyone else in XYZ, I wouldn't care. What's your problem with him, idiot? She answered, crossing her arms tighter over her chest. He's a jerk. I think he has to be to be with you. But he also always puts engineering down. If I report him to management, he will be fired and my life in the engineering department will be better. If George finds out too, I'll get back at you for how shitty you've treated me my whole life, I said, grinning from ear to ear. So if I slept with someone else at work, you wouldn't tell George? She asked hesitantly. Most likely no. If I agree to break up with Simmons by telling him that someone threatened to file a complaint against him, would you tell George? This is step number one, I said. We had to come to the first morning meeting of the conference. I showered first, got dressed, and then sat on the edge of the bed, covering my face with my hands, when Amber sauntered out of the bathroom. Why are you so gloomy, asshole? She asked in her usual sarcastic tone. The main reason is that I thought that if I did this, I would get rid of the hatred and not want to be with you again. Only after the conference, crazy guy, she giggled. Just wondering why I'm crazy? I smiled. Sleeping with your married cousin? I would call it madness. As you often delicately pointed out when we were children, we are not blood relatives. After the conference, we had breakfast. I extended my stay in my room until Thursday evening while Amber moved her things from her room to mine. While she was moving her things, I called George on his cell phone, a number he had given me specifically for this purpose. Hey, George. I have good news and bad, so began my cliché. Crap, he exclaimed. First tell me the bad news. Amber will be staying here one more night because the conference will run late and she has additional responsibilities. Today she and I are working on a project together. When she calls to tell you depicted surprise, but I wanted you to know that it wasn't because of an affair with the guy I thought was the most likely suspect of having an affair. Amazing. He practically giggled. What's the good news? I saw her slap a guy who approached her, and I never saw her get mixed up with anyone else despite the opportunities for it. Thanks, man. I owe you. That means you won't get 10000 he chuckled. George is an assholey, as always, I thought to myself, but remained silent. No, but I thought about it a little more and decided that telling you about it was the right decision. So I would have refused the money even if the news had been different. I'll think of some way to thank you, he whispered. After Amber called George, we put a do not disturb sign on the door. This was almost three months ago. Since then, Amber and I continued to insult each other daily while maintaining a relationship. I really wish I could stop, but I can't. The reason is that the scientists doing the lust-hate study are writing an article solely about my relationship with her. Anonymously, of course. They interview me over the phone every week, and I've even gotten Amber to share her thoughts with them on a weekly basis. We don't tell each other what we say to the psychologist and other scientists, and they don't tell us what the other person said. This is too bad, because while it's easy to understand why I hate her, I'd really like to know why she hates me, if that's really the case. I'm still trying to deal with my feelings. Honestly, I hate her. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.